everybody another minute or two. As you can see, the waiting room is filling up. So for those of you, those of you who've just got here, do have a go at the poll. Let us know on a scale of 0 to 10 how confident you currently feel about finances, with one being not confident at all and 10 being like, I'm absolutely nailing this. <laughs> and all answers are totally valid. That is why you're here. We're really hoping that we can boost that score. Even if it's by a point, then there has been a positive outcome of you being here on this Bet You and AVS event this evening. So we really appreciate your honest answers as we keep letting people in. We'll keep giving a quick update on that. Keep letting us know in the chat box as well. So we've got quite a few fifth years, quite a few fourth years. Good to see you all. Like we say, fourth years, you are going to be ahead of the curve here, knowing this stuff really early on. So well done for being here. And a couple of years experience, just graduated. So thank you for popping that in the chat for us. Absolutely brilliant. Have we got any final update as we get started, Ebony, on how the room is feeling right now about confidence in new grad finances? Yeah, we've got a real mix from, from one to eight. Uh, but the, the highest kind of scores are the fours, fives and sixes at the moment. Yeah. Super. So hopefully, like we say, we should be able to raise that score up for you and get you feeling a little more confident with lots of the things that certainly the Vet U team wish they'd been told as graduates and didn't need to find out five or six years graduated or even longer than that. So you are in for a good evening. As ever, this is a really safe space. You can't ask stupid questions. There's no such thing, but please do feel free to message any of the Vet U team directly. If there's something that you want to ask and you're a little bit worried about it, that's absolutely fine. If you're thinking it, somebody else is probably thinking it as well. So you definitely won't be the first one to ask it and you're probably not the only one to be wondering it either. So I think it's about time that we got started. We'll stop the poll. Thank you so much for taking part in that and for your honest answers. It is very much appreciated. And we're really looking forward to making this a valuable and useful evening for you. We will have questions and answers at the end too. So please do drop your questions in. If we can answer them as we go, we will do. But we do have some time at the end to try and get through as many of those as we can do. So thank you so much for being here for this evening's event, which is your first 100 days in practice. Whether you are already in practice, you're about to find a job, you're in fourth year, you're in third year, wherever you're up to, this is for you this evening. And we have been so pleased to team up with AVS on this one. So I'm going to hand over to the AVS president, Callum, for us to hear a little bit from the AVS team. And you can see here who we are joined by on the call. We've got Callum and Charlotte and potentially Izzy coming along to join us as well. So over to you, Callum. Yeah, thanks, Katie. Um, I'll just keep it short and sweet. Um, I think it's a real pleasure to be back with you guys as part of your team and, and bringing this webinar to students. Um, we kind of know how difficult the financial situation is right now for a lot of students and especially as they step out into that first job it's so crucial we set good habits and practice. So yeah real pleasure to be back and uh, looking forward to this session where um, looking at the slide deck it looks as if it's going to be a good one. Um, and from the AVS team tonight um, we're going to be joined by the wonderful Charlotte, um, Junior Vice President. Um, Izzy is going to be joining us a wee bit later um, giving a wee bit of a, a touch of her experience as a, a new grad as she's just started a job um, and unfortunately you'll have to listen to my not so dulcet Glaswegian tones um, as well but yeah over to you Katie and, and the Vet U team. Thank you so much Callum and we're always thrilled to work with AVS on these events that we've put on I can't even remember how many of these now and we always get such fantastic feedback of how useful and how helpful they were so thank you again. And briefly, before we get started, just to introduce us, the Vet U team, we are four vets from completely different backgrounds, different levels of experience. And you'll see here, we've got three of us on the call, but we will be joined by our fourth team member shortly as well. We've got Ebony Escalona, we've got Paul Horwood, we've got Matt Dobbs, and we've got myself, Katie Ford, as well. We have experience from large animal, small animal, equine, as employers, as employees, as freelancers, working as portfolio professionals, working as locums, looking at working in corporate and independent. We have a huge range of experience, but we also know firsthand how important it is to have a grasp on a lot of these financial education pieces. 
and knowing what products are, knowing who's out there to help you. And we are aligned with a passion for helping veterinary professionals actually to be able to take control of their financial um, freedom, essentially, and meaning that that is going to be the route to happiness is independence and financial independence and knowing that you are protected, knowing that you know who to speak to and knowing that you've got people that have your interests at heart too. So we work alongside a lot of trusted professionals that we formed relationships with, that we connect you with, alongside educating you on some of these more taboo topics that nobody tells us about. And we really wish that they would do in vet school. And a lot of veterinary professionals will find these things out the hard way. So we try and get those educational pieces out early. That's why you sat here. So we can put you ahead of the game in these first 100 days in practice, answer your questions. Like we've said before, there are no stupid questions. And we're thrilled this evening to be joined by one of the independent financial advisors that we've worked with a lot, that has worked with a lot of veterinary professionals in the past and has appeared on many of these events with us too, Andrew Snowball, who is going to be covering a lot of their financial products that nobody ever really mentions and demystifying what they are, what they mean, such as pensions and income protection too. So we're really briefly just going to show you what is on the menu for this evening on the next slide. So we're going to start looking at job offers, which Paul is going to cover. What is it really worth? Yes, we see a number on paper, but what is involved in that? What is our take home pay? Yes, we see a salary, but what is going to end up in our bank account at the end of the day? That is a really important thing for us to get our head around. When we then go, come on to realizing how much is going to be left for us, what are we going to be spending that on? What are we going to budget? Are we going to set something in place to make sure we've got things like emergency funds? And then finally, Andrew is going to be taking us through what we can actually protect because they're the really important things because you are valuable as professionals. So we'd like to help you protect your health, your income, and your future and that's what we're going to be empowering you to do as well. And then finally, we'll go on to some next steps with Bet You as well as a Q&A session where you can ask anything that you'd like to ask of the VetU team and of Andrew, and we'll be here to help you too. So if you do want to ask anything anonymously, again, you can message any of the VetU team just by selecting our name in the chat box as well. We're gonna have a couple of polls throughout as well, just to check in on how you're feeling. And again, just take notes, make the most of this. It will be recorded, but yep, use this to your advantage and let's see if we can set you up for success financially over the next 100 days or when you are due to start your job the 100 days after that too. So over to Paul Horwood from the VetU team and um, let's learn a little bit more about the job offer and what it's really worth. Awesome, thanks Katie. Um, hi everyone, so uh, for the next um, 10 minutes or so we're just going to delve into um, looking at how much money you're actually going to get for doing all the amazing stuff that you've learned over the last four, five, six years at vet school. Uh, and now, well, amazingly, someone's going to pay you for that, uh, for that skill, which is great. Um, when we start out and when we start uh, getting pay offers, getting uh, job offers, um, it's quite important to make sure you know what you're getting offered. And therefore, you can actually start comparing apples with apples. A lot of people, certainly I used to make this mistake, you miss out the a salary package is worth this as opposed to the salary. And so we'll just delve into what a salary package might include. Um, it might not be just 100% um, about the salary. Now, I absolutely get that um, there are many, many reasons to accept the job, not just money. You know, location, species, the amount of support you're gonna get, absolutely vital when you're first coming out into that, into that first role, that first job as a vet. Um, and so there's loads and loads of other reasons why you should or shouldn't accept the job. But just for tonight, we're, we're, because we're talking finances, we're just gonna drill into the salary package and the money and the finances. But please, you know, we're not saying that there's not an awful lot of other stuff that you need to make sure about before before just diving in there. Now, obviously, you are going to get offered a basic salary, um, but if we are now getting hopefully getting two or three or four um, job offers given to us, how do we actually start comparing uh, the job offers, the salary packages um, with each other? Uh, and in terms of what we actually get um, uh, get offered in that, starting off at the top, pensions. This one's a little bit annoying. Uh, unfortunately, I think. I'm, I might mention this a few times as we go through this talk today. The veterinary world is a little bit stingy when it comes to other stuff. 
uh, other benefits and other things that are that are tagged on to, to your salary, unfortunately. It's just how it is and how the, the veterinary culture is. Um, lots of job offers will say, oh, we're giving you a pension. Well, that's a little bit disingenuous because they have to. By law, the employer must give you uh, a pension. Uh, now, if the, if the uh, employer is giving you a bigger pension than they legally have to, then absolutely, that's something that they should be shouting about in the job advert. That's brilliant. Unfortunately, most of them are giving you the absolute bare minimum, which is just 3% at the moment. So uh, in a pension, what happens at the moment with auto enrollment is uh, your employer will take 5% and you'll keep that, but they'll put it in a pension and then they'll give you an extra 3% of your salary and pop that into your pension for you. So just saying, oh, I'm giving you a pension is a little bit disingenuous because they have to, so all jobs uh, will have to do that. Next, you'll often see CPD, continuous professional development thrown in there as well, somewhere probably around 1,000, maybe 1,500 pounds, maybe even more um, on that. Um, it's worth checking into the detail on this a little bit. You know, I have started to hear rumours out there that people are starting to say that there are clawbacks on that. If I, if you leave within six months or twelve months of starting a job, how much of that CPD are they going to uh, are they going to want to come back? Now, I can understand it. It's fair enough. There's a bit of give and take there. If the uh, employer is going to invest a large amount of money into training you up, they will want you to stay for a certain amount of time before you. Um, uh, and if you leave before that, they'll want they'll want that back. But especially at the moment, probably a lot of you are looking at uh, the internships or the new graduate packages, the new graduate one or two year training packages that are out there from lots and lots of corporates and, uh, and some of the larger independents. Um, have a look at the small print in there. You know, yes, these are really good packages. Um, there's a lot of training, there's a lot of support built into those. But if you leave, if it turns out to not be the job you want and you leave within that first year or two years, is there a clawback? Are you going to have to pay to, to get out of that? So they might be fantastic. Just be aware of, um, of what the, the negatives are on that. Professional fees. A lot of um, uh, salary packages will have uh, will cover your VDS, your professional insurance uh, and your Royal College fees. Um, this sounds great, but actually it's not that much money. So, you know, in some situations it might be better. You might prefer just to get the cash, just get a, a, a bigger uh, basic salary. BDS is probably seven or eight hundred pounds a year. Uh, if you were paying it yourself, uh, RCBS fees is just under 400 quid. So it's not much more than a thousand pounds that they're offering you there. That may or may not be beneficial. If you're trying to compare two salary packages, one doesn't have VDS, but is two grand more. Maybe that's if, if it's just about the money, maybe that's the one to take. Other benefits, this is where it starts to get a little bit more difficult. Uh, some practices will give you a car or a van. Uh, and there's a lot of, um, uh, that, that's quite a difficult, complicated area to get into uh, because it starts to look into whether it's electric or what the emissions are, whether it's just for uh, use as a, uh, a veterinary car or whether you can use it in personal use and stuff. Uh, but those sorts of benefits, uh, I've got a slide on this, these sort of benefiting kind um, do probably mean that you will end up paying a little bit more tax because of them. Um, uh, the car is an interesting one uh, as, a, as a very rough uh, sort of finger in the air. If you're a small animal and you're not ambulatory, it's probably worth not having the car. If you are farm animal or equine and you're charging around all day from farm to farm or stable to stable, uh, it probably is worth it. But there's a lot of it. There is a big grey area um, in between. Bonuses. Not many packages uh, will be on... Um, uh, not many new grab packages out there offer a bonus scheme, but uh, as you move through your career, you may well end up being offered a, a bonus package based on turnover or hitting certain targets uh, from it. Have a think. Do you want it? Do you like that idea? Is this something that you're comfortable with, uh, having a bonus for, for doing X, Y, Z, hitting certain things? Um, is it achievable? I can offer you a million pound bonus, but if there's no chance of you ever achieving it, is that really a, a fair bonus to, to offer? So have a little think about these things. They are there to design to attract you in. Are you comfortable with that? Phone, again, you know, a few hundred pounds, maybe even up to a thousand pounds might be nice to have a, a nice fancy phone. But does this mean that you are now obliged to have it on 24-7 and, uh, and be at the beck and call all the time? 
And then finally, and we'll have a little chat at the end, um, is the sort of the, the other bits that are starting to be added on, uh, income protection, private health care, those sorts of things. Um, again, it's worth just checking out, are these contractual? Are you definitely going to have private health care? Is it, uh, can the employer just change provider and therefore change what you're uh, covered for uh, at the drop of a hat? Do, would you prefer to have it in your name or are you happy having it in the uh, in the company's name? Bear in mind that if you suddenly want to go traveling, become a locum, move jobs, as soon as you leave, that cover stops. If it's in your name, perhaps it doesn't. So now probably the most important bit, uh, certainly the one that I was most excited about, uh, was actually getting cash uh, every month for, uh, for doing a job, which was lovely. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, lots and lots of other people start to put their hands in your pay packet uh, and take little bits away from it. Um, and it's worth just, you know, some of you who are more experienced, perhaps you've had jobs before, uh, will we'll know this already. Some of you, uh, if, this, if this is going to be your first job, uh, might be a little bit surprised that uh, they said they were going to give me £30,000 a year and I didn't get £30,000 a year. We all know tax um, is there to pay for all the benefits of, uh, of living in the country, et cetera, et cetera. How it works out, how they actually work it out very quickly, there's a lot more nuances to it, uh, but very quickly, there's an income tax and you're allowed to earn about 12 and a half thousand pounds per year. This gets tweaked up and down by the government, this, this free amount that you can earn before anyone taxes you. Um, and so 12 and a half grand tax-free uh, you can earn. Once you go above that, Every pound you earn, the government takes 20% of that. If you then start to get above 50,000 pounds a year, then they start to take 40%. And if any of you get a, a salary over 150,000 pounds a year, great first job, well done. Um, uh, that will then rise to 45% uh, of that, which the, uh, which the government will take. These, these, um, uh, these bands can change. Uh, and to be fair, having gone through COVID and lots of and Brexit and other bits and pieces, there's a fair chance over the next uh, 5, 10, 15 years uh, that we might end up having to pay a little bit more tax because of that. Now, the one that I never noticed or realised or uh, was surprised about is there's another tax on the top of this called national insurance. Really, it should be uh, stuck in with income tax, in my opinion, because it is exactly that. It's just another income tax. Uh, 50, 60 years ago, they brought it in to pay for the National Health Service and to pay for unemployment benefit. It's now just morphed into this, uh, into this other tax. But you now pay another 12% on any earnings over £9,500. On top of that, someone else is putting their hand in their pocket and taking 5% of your earnings uh, to put into a pension pot. Now, it's still your money, but you're not going to get it until you're, uh, until you're hitting retirement age. So it's a good thing. You're, they're forcing everyone on an auto enrolment to have a pension. Uh, but it does mean that certainly when you're starting off and you've got lots of, uh, lots of pressures on your salary, uh, a little bit extra is going to disappear, which you will get back in 40 years time, etc. Uh, and then again, obviously, the dreaded student loan repayments will start hitting in. Perhaps they won't hit in quite so uh, quite so hard, but it's about 9% of your earnings above £2,200 is where it starts to uh, starts to hit in and starts to take. I mentioned that there was um, benefit in kinds as well. These are, this is where the, the tax man says, if you get a benefit, so something you don't need really for your job, something nice, um, that perhaps you should have paid for, but your employer is paying for, even though you get it for free, the tax man says, I still want 20% of that or 40% if you're, if you're earning over 50,000 pounds. And those sorts of things, probably the big ones that are gonna hit you are if you have a car or a van, there will be a tax uh, to pay on that, a benefit in kind tax to pay on that. It's more, it's a, it's, it's not very simple because again, if it's electric or if it's got, depending on the emissions of it, there's a, there's a big complicated uh, calculation to make, but you will be paying extra tax, even though it's a free car. Um, uh, medical insurance, if someone gives you medical insurance, private medical insurance, again, you will have to pay a little bit of tax on that. Um, Accommodation is a tricky one. Accommodation would be brilliant, because that's a big expense. Certainly when you're starting off, a massive chunk of your income is going to go on rent or mortgage payments, et cetera. So wouldn't it be nice if your employer could give you accommodation? It's a bit tricky. If, if, you're, if you're living above the practice, and I'm going to make it very simple here, if you're living above the practice and you're on call, it probably is going to be tax-free. 
if you are living, uh, you know, a few miles away and it's a lovely house, it's prob the tax man is probably going to say, well, that's something you should have bought or paid for yourself and therefore I'm going to charge you tax on it. It's a bit more complicated than that. Uh, and I have to say, more and more practices are not offering accommodation. But if you do, uh, it's worth just looking into it because um, the tax man may or may not decide that that is, um, is taxable or not. So if you're on call and you're living above the practice, you're probably OK. If you're living a long way away, and especially if you're not doing out of hours, if it's off to vets now or Equicall, et cetera, um, then, uh, then the tax man probably will think that is a, a benefit in kind. So quickly, the big numbers, what are you actually going to get in your pocket? So I've made some big assumptions here on this quick calculation. I've just assumed you're getting paid 30,000 as a, as a fairly standard generic um, uh, new grad salary, uh, and you haven't got any, any, anything else complicated um, going on there. Interestingly, between now, if you start work now, between now and April, because the tax year is April to April, you actually don't pay as much tax because you're only going to be working for um, what uh, just over half the year. Uh, and so actually, after you have your salary, tax at 20%, national insurance at 12%, some sort of benefit in kind, bit of pension, bit of student loan, your take home pay is just over two grand a month in your pocket to go and have fun with. <laughs> After that, it comes down a little bit because now you're earning more and it's spread over 12 months. So again, tax at 20%, national insurance, a bit of pension, bit of student loan, and your take home pay is somewhere around 18, 1900 pounds per month to take. Which surprised me when I first qualified, I was like, hmm, it's not quite as much as I was kind of expecting or, or hoping for. Ebbs, shall we run a poll? How are we doing? <laughs> Yes, we've covered a lot of ground here, people. Um, and it'd be great if uh, Izzy has got back in from work, if she can share a little bit about um, what she reviewed in her package when uh, she took her recent job. So let's just launch this poll. If you can't use the polls, please pop it in the chat. Your reflections are just as important as your polls. How are you feeling now about understanding that pay packet side of that contract? Um, I understand it really well. Perhaps you already did anyway, which is great. Uh, this is making more sense, uh, but I still have questions. Um, perhaps you're feeling a bit stumped still. Um, I was already 100% sure or other let us know in the chat. And some of this may have sparked some thoughts for you that you might want to share in the chat. It might be about a package you've currently got or you're reviewing or maybe questions um, that you have. Um, we can all learn together from each other's experiences on this. So, so do, do share your reflections there as well so we'll just let it go for a little bit longer and izzy's just uh, very kindly popped into the chat there i looked into what the extras were i.e any medical insurance or association memberships memberships that weren't included i also specifically looked into whether i would be asked to use my own car for business travel as that would affect my insurance premium and the type of insurance needed so that's another really good point about insurance for personal um, versus business as well as petrol for personal versus business as well so, so far here we've got 62% um, of you are saying, um, I understand really well, no thank you. 26% um, of you are saying this is making more sense, but I still have questions. Well, that's what we're here for. 10% of you are still feeling a bit stumped. Do pop it in the chat if there's anything specifically or direct messages if you want to ask anonymous because we are here to help you understand and we can also chat to you offline about it as well. Um, and other let us know in the chat as well. Uh, Izzy said she also looked into the pension scheme as I'm keen to get this started ASAP and have just had my first pay packet through and options for joining the pension scheme. So that's brilliant. Excellent. Brilliant. Yeah, the, the pension one's a really interesting one. And I know Andrew's um, going to bring that to life uh, in a bit. Um, un unfortunately, as I said, we are quite stingy in the vet world and most employers out there are just offering the absolute bare minimum uh, in terms of what they will put in and, and, and take. So that means that if you just rely on that as your pension, it's you're not going to be, uh, you know, traveling around the world, uh, you know, spending the kids inheritance, uh, doing around the world yacht racing, etc. in your 60s and 70s, if you are just putting the absolute bare minimum in. But we can, uh, uh, Andrew will sort of uh, expand on what you put in now and what you get out at the end, etc, uh, etc. Et cool. Right. This bit is, is always the, yeah, 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 I know I should be doing this, but I haven't. Um, this is your budgeting, you know, if you're very wealthy, if you've got loads of cash, you probably don't need to worry so much about budgeting. 
when you first start out and your salary is not that big and you've got all the debts and worry and the and the issues that uh, five or six years at uh, London or Edinburgh has cost you, um, it is important because a, a few hundred quid here or there is going to make the difference. So just in terms of what to do now, this is this is my advice, not really vet use advice. Uh, first thoughts are don't worry too much about that first pay packet. You know, the first month is really, I mean, uh, I'll probably ask, I'm not sure where Matt is on, the, on there, but I, I think I went out and bought a, 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 t a big TV for my first pay packet. It's just like, yep, yeah, brilliant. Thank you very much. I'm there. But once you're done, once you're in, once you're into the, the marathon, the, the, the normal jogging of earning and having a salary at the end of, um, at the end of each month, uh, what are you going to do with it? How much have you got left at the, at the end? And so it's not the most exciting thing, but you need to sort of sit down and work out where, <laughs> yeah, well done, Matt, a soft top, a soft top sports car. Excellent. Um, what you need to do is work out what your um, outgoings are, what your expenses are. So this is your mortgage, your rent, your council tax, uh, your, your phone, food and drink. you have still got to have fun um, and, you know, clothes, hobbies, etc. Work out how much it's going to cost. Uh, work out how much you've got coming in. Uh, and then you can sort of look and see, well, actually, you know, thank, hopefully it's a, it's a positive number, but hopefully your, your income is slightly above your, uh, your outgoings. Uh, and that then gives, says, right, well, I've got 100, 200, 300, 400 pounds per month over what I need just to survive and have a little bit of enjoyment. Uh, what can I do with that sort, of, that, that sort of cash? What can I actually do with it? Um, uh, and I'll, I'll hand over to Andrew in a second here, but really this is where uh, it's worth having a think about what you can do to protect. And at VetU, we've sort of put it into three categories. We said the three big things that you need to worry about or think about or, or ensure is making sure your income is protected. What happens if you can't work? Now, uh, the, the, one of the biggest drivers for me and Matt and Ebony and Katie for setting up VetU was all of us know people who we've gone through vet school with who have uh, either had injuries or illnesses, which have meant they've had to take a, a significant amount of time out of their career. What happens if you can't earn any money because you can't work as a vet because you've got a, an injury or an illness, which is taking you out for six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 12 months um, out of it? Now, it's worth having a look at your um, it's worth having a look at your um, contract of employment because in it, it will say how long your statutory sick pay or how long your company is going to look after you. Again, I've said it before, the vet world is really, really stingy. Uh, most companies will offer you two, three, four weeks of statutory sick pay. I've seen some around six weeks, very, very, very few above that. Um, if your company, if you're injured for more than six weeks, your company pays you for six weeks and then that's it. You want a statutory sick pay. That's 90 pounds a week. I'm not sure many of us would be having a great life on 90 pounds a week if you've got to pay rent and food and accommodation and everything else like that. So what happens if you can't earn? You know, even the luckier, the luckiest of us might then have to move back in with, your, with our parents. Well, that's not that lucky, is it? You know, uh, I mean, they've just got rid of us. So just have a think, how can I make sure that if I can't, and it doesn't happen to many of us, but it does happen to some of us. If I can't, what can I what can I do to make sure I've still got an income coming in? Health again, vets. There was a BVA sur survey out uh, in 2019, I think it was, which showed that 60% uh, of vets were getting injured every year. Uh, some uh, having to take significant amounts of time off. We get injured, especially those perhaps who drive more or are with larger animals, but even cat, even cat bites and scratches and stuff mean that your fingers swell up and you can't do surgery. How can we uh, get ourselves healed, get ourselves fixed better? Well, perhaps private health insurance is a nice way to, uh, to speed us back up. Uh, and then finally, your future. Making sure that if you start now, you can actually have a, a decent, comfortable retirement rather than scrimping and saving every penny uh, when you're sort of in your 70s or 80s. So that was a quick run over why, what vet you feels about it. Now over to the professionals. We all, we all get a bit upset with Dr. Google when they walk in, uh, when our clients walk in. So we should probably uh, sing, sing, that, uh, sing that mantra as well and say we should perhaps listen to the experts. So I'll hand over to, uh, to Andrew. Thanks, Paul. Good evening, everyone. Am I on mute? No, I'm on mute. Nope. It's always good. 
first time for everything, getting it right. Um, yeah, if you can flick over to next slide, please, mate. Um, so uh, over the next few minutes or so, I'm going to talk a little bit about income protection and pensions. So the now and the future, and really answering the big question, which is, am I going to be okay if and when? Um, these are these are products that I'm talking about, and and in my normal sort of business day, I talk about lifestyle financial planning. So that's the bigger picture in terms of you putting all this hard work to get to where you are now and focusing on what you want to do in the future in your life, not just about work and how we get you there. And these are some of the tools that we help uh, that we use to help you achieve um, some of those lifestyle objectives. So. We'll start with income protection, which is massively important, especially in the veteran world. In my world, in terms of financial services, the sick pay we get and the benefits are fantastic. So we don't really ever really have to think about it. But for the most part, um, what I've experienced is that the sick pay benefits aren't particularly great. So it means that you then have to rely, as Paul alluded to, to uh, statutory sick pay, which only lasts for up to 28 weeks. As Paul said, a little over £90 or a little over £95. And then you have to apply um, from, for additional support, which for most of us, especially if we're in rented accommodation or have a mortgage, isn't going to get us where we need to get to. So it's hugely important that we consider income protection. So what is income protection? Well, income protection pays you a monthly benefit, which is tax free, uh, if you're unable to do the material parts of your job for a considerable uh, amount of time. Now, it doesn't replace all of your salary. Broadly speaking, it's somewhere between 50 to 65 percent, can be slightly higher, slightly lower, depending on the provider and the, and the policy that you're taking up. Um, in terms of when you're looking to take up a policy or, or, or looking into a policy, one of the key things that you want to look at is making sure that it covers your own occupation. Um, so that's not whether your, speci uh, your speciality is a vet, but just make sure that it covers you as, um, as a vet. Um, really important because typically when people are doing the research themselves for a policy, they will look for the cheapest policy. Now, the cheapest policy is more than likely not going to be an own occupation policy. So you'll get something thinking, yes, I've got a fantastic deal. But if you then go and claim, the insurance company will say, well, you can still stack shelves at Tesco's, not picking on Tesco's. Um, therefore, they wouldn't pay out. So really important. That that's something that you look at as well. Um, in terms of the way that the policy works, it's obviously related to your employment. Um, and then it stops paying out if you're able to go back to work or if you unfortunately pass away. Um, in terms of the cover itself is when you're trying to calculate the level of benefit that you're going to need, if you cast your mind back to the a couple of slides that Paul showed regarding budgeting, there we were looking at our income and our expenditure and we were looking at core expenditure and lifestyle expenditure. So your core expenditure will be the things that you have to pay. So rent, food, uh, utility bills, as an example. So if you're doing the research yourself, then that's the minimum that you want your benefit to be able to cover, which is your core expenditure. And then you can add things on top, like lifestyle expenditure, so subscription and, and things like that. Um, some of the other key elements to uh, income protection that impact the level of premiums that you pay will be something that's called a deferred period. So that's how long you have to wait after a successful claim before the policy starts paying out. Now, typically when I work with um, vets, we, 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 we look around about the three month period. And that's because when we look at the wider financial planning, one of the recommendations I make is that you ensure that you have at least three months of your essential expenditure as an emergency fund. So that helps support that. And also it helps reduce the um, level of premium that you have to pay. And then some of the other obvious things are how long you have the cover for. So typically that would be in line with when you 
think you're going to retire. You know, lots of people I speak to think they're going to retire at 55. The reality is it's going to be a lot further than that. You laugh for, but it comes up every time. <laughs> um, and then obviously it's the level of benefit that you want as well. <clears throat> so to give you a ballpark figure, if you're in your mid twenties and you're in the region of 1,000 to 1,500 pounds a month benefit with a three month deferred scheme, sorry, three month deferred uh, deferment period, you're looking in the region of 25 pounds to 35 pounds. It was really um, specific to the individual what the level of premium is going to be. Um, and there are lots of nuances between the um, main providers. Uh, but those are the main things that you want to look at. And some of the things that uh, don't often get talked about is the additional benefits that you get as part of the policy that you don't actually have to claim on. So there's uh, these days with most policies, you'll also get 24-7 uh, um, access to a GP, which will be online. You'll also get some mental health support with a lot of the um, providers now. Um, uh, and potentially some additional benefits like free physio sessions uh, and free health checks. So it's always important to look at the policy in its entirety. And given the importance of this type of policy, the, um, the premium really, although it's important, shouldn't be your main focus. Uh, your main focus should be on the level of cover you get and the support that's available within the policy itself. And <clears throat> something that's always important with all financial planning is that make sure that you review the level of cover that you have as your career progresses, whether that's uh, more income or you reduce your hours. Make sure, one, that you're not paying uh, overpaying for something uh, that you've got, or two, make sure that the benefits that you've got keeps up with, um, with, with your salary increase. And the last point on that is... <clears throat> when you take out a policy, you've got the option to have something that's called indexation. And all that means in English is that as the cost of living goes up in terms of inflation, you can have that built into the benefit that you have. So that matches it. So when you do have to make a claim, that's also uh, your benefit also is increasing as well. So essentially, that pound is keeps its value through the life of the policy. Move on to the next one. When you're ready. <clears throat> so pensions, uh, my favourite topic. Uh, pensions, in my view, very sexy and very exciting. I'm probably the only person that thinks that, uh, but it's okay. I'm all right to be in that camp on my own. So essentially, um, a pension is uh, a long-term savings pot, right? And historically, these things are, you do your 40 years and you pull your pension, it gives you a specific level of income. Uh, the world changed in about 2014, 2015, that allowed us, have to, allowed us as, uh, uh, I guess, customers or pension holders to have greater flexibility to how we access our pension. So the magic thing about a pension is that when you put in some money, the government puts in some money as well. So happy days, you know, it's not often that that happens, right? Um, going back to Paul's point in terms of the auto enrollment, Although auto enrollment values are not fantastic, the premise behind them were to encourage us to uh, save for our retirement. So this is just a little boost and it's a starting point. So if you're on an average, <clears throat> I think I think you guys said that the average graduates on 30,000 pounds, is that ballpark there or thereabouts? <clears throat> okay, so if that's the case, your annual pension contributions is somewhere around two and a half thousand pounds, roughly just over 200 pounds a month. Now that's not gonna set the world alight if you're working for 40 years, and as Paul alluded to, the lump sum that you get or the pot of money that you get at the end. So it's really, really important that you start early and if possible, you slowly increase the contributions that you're making. Now, although it's not a precise science because I'm not speaking to you individually and working out a plan for you, but, as a rule of thumb, aim for somewhere in the region of 20% uh, growth going into your pension over a period of time. Now, 8%, as Paul said before, is already being done through auto enrollment. So you've got, just got to make up the other 
what that will do is give you a great opportunity to get a decent standard of living supported through your pension. Something to always remember that when it comes to retirement, it's about um, it's about um, sources of income. So hopefully the state pension will still be about. So you'll have that as a source of income. You have your private pension and and or other sources of income to contribute to your your retirement. Uh, people always ask whether what's a good pension, what's a bad pension. There's no such thing. There are poor investments within your pension uh, and there's you just not contributing to your pension. So broadly speaking, if you just contribute into a pension on a regular basis, as early as you can and make those incremental increases to that target of 20% or above, if you can do it, the likelihood is if you start early enough, you'll do fine. Um, as a financial advisor, I would suggest and highly recommend that you speak to someone at the early stage to help you put that plan in place. And then that doesn't necessarily mean you need a financial advisor to hold your hand for the entire journey, but at least it helps you put a plan in place that you can work to. And then you can review that on an annual basis or biannual basis, whichever works, works for you. Um, in terms of when you come to retire, the pot that I mentioned before, 25% of it is tax free. Uh, and you can take that all in one lump sum or in increments. And then the residual amount is taxed at your marginal rate of taxation. So boring. Uh, if you're a taxpayer, you'll pay 25% tax. Non-rate taxpayer, you won't pay any tax, uh, uh, tax at all. Um, and pensions in themselves are a great way to pass on benefits. I know you're probably thinking this is a million miles away, but it's a great way of passing on wealth through the generations because it sits outside of your... Um, outside your estate as well. And for those of you who have uh, um, uh, ideas of um, starting your own business or uh, being a locum, uh, a pension is a great way to uh, extract profits from your business. It's probably the most tax efficient way actually of extracting profits from your business and reducing your tax liability as well. But that is for another presentation and another day. And that's it on pensions. Oh, something I should say before you get onto that, Paul, um, is that um, as VetU members, uh, you are able to book in uh, a free consultation, or say free, at my cost, a consultation to discuss um, protection, pensions, mortgages, all things financial advice world. Uh, and utilize that even if it's just to if you know everything and you have a plan in place even this just to have a chat uh, and make sure that what you understand is right then please do it and that's me should i say some more no, that's super so thank you and there's some really great questions coming in in the chat as well so it'd be super and you go in there and, and have a have a, a gander uh, and answer. So we're just going to show you some next steps and we're going to open up the floor for questions and um, Charlotte and uh, Callum have got some questions that have been pre-submitted by you lovely lot as well. Um, so yeah, please do pop anything you, you want to ask into that chat. And again, if you don't want to ask it publicly with everyone, you can um, direct message any one of us here that are on the screen with you. So firstly, let's check out your digital delegate bag. We've basically been collating over the year a number of resources for, that people want more support on. That's everything from financial health checks through to negotiation, um, through to pension checkers, you, you name it. So we've got a bit of a digital delegate bag there and we're gonna keep adding to it. So if you're like, oh, I really would love a resource on insert what you want, let us know and we'll either find one or create one for you. Make sure as well to register at VetU, it's completely, free and it means that you can be put in contact with a financial advisor or other financial professionals to have your questions answered and the people that we are working alongside are as Andrew says not free at cost to them they are really wanting to support this professional cohort of all of us because we're all very intelligent in the scientific sense we're not always so intelligent when it comes to our finances and I'm speaking about myself here when I say that so you can go on to betu.co.uk as well and then finally as well as Katie's popped into the chat we do have Calendly links um, where you can automatically register uh, with 
Andrew and, and, um, and book a time that suits you to have a chat. Katie. And we thought this might be a, a good point as well, didn't we, Ebony, to ask Izzy if she was happy to jump in because we're going to run a poll in a minute and whilst that's ongoing to get Izzy, who is the Senior Vice President of AVS, to talk a little bit about her experiences of how being on calls like this and using vet use resources has helped her going into her first job and maybe inspire some of you on the call because you'll resonate far more with Izzy's experiences than us who've graduated many, many years back now. And yeah, I know Izzy was quite keen to, to share a little bit. So Izzy, I'm going to hand over to you. And in the meantime, we'll have a little poll running just to see if any of you are interested in speaking with Andrew, which is a really, really valuable opportunity. Like we say, Andrew gives up his time for this. There's no obligation. You can scan the QR code. The link is in the chat. It's also in the digital delegate bag if you do want to revisit. And we've had people book a call within as soon as an hour. That's probably not going to happen this evening because I imagine Andrew is not going to be uh, on calls at 10 o'clock this evening. But you should be able to book in over the next week and just chat through anything that's come up for you on this call. And he can give you some professional guidance too. So I'm going to hand over to Izzy to tell us a little bit more about how VetU has influenced you going into the vet world. Congratulations and what benefits it's brought you to. Uh, thanks, guys. Um, so I started my job on the 9th of August. So I've very this week is my fourth week. So I've nearly been here a month now. And I literally last Friday had my first paycheck come through, which was definitely needed after furnishing a house and losing student finance. Um, <laughs> um, but I definitely found the vet you talks previously all really helpful. Like one of the main things that stuck with me is the insurance and um, getting the pension sorted, which I had my my letter come through last last Wednesday or something um, about setting up my pension and um, the pension scheme that our work, our practice has and everything and how to join on to that. Um, I did send a message to my dad. It's like, which one do I want to join? <laughs> he was like, all of them. <laughs> um, uh, he, so my dad um, has also been drilling into me that get the pension sorted as well. Um, but with the insurance as well, I when I was looking into the contracts and everything, I I was quite tight on the insurance side and getting them to clarify whether they they would expect me to do any driving. Um, of my own car to clients or anything or anything like that and in which case um, if they would then would they a pay petrol because um, for us we have five practices that span throughout Suffolk um, so it's quite a lot of mileage <laughs> um, and also that would also affect the type of insurance I could have so um, not only would that put my insurance up it would also change the type of insurance I needed um, so making sure that I was fully covered for that as well um, I did actually think about the health insurance and um, income protection the other day when I managed to inject um, a DHP vac vaccine into my finger and it went whoop and it um, and I couldn't bend my finger or put it in a glove or anything for a good few days um, so I haven't actually sorted that yet, but it's on my list to do. Um, but yeah, I definitely thought about that. Like, oh, oh no, <laughs> I'm less than a month in and I already can't do surgery. Um, but yeah, that I've already, again, on my list to book in with VetU to have to have a talk about <laughs> um, how I can set all these things up. Um, but I think had I not attended the other talks that you guys have done previously, I, I wouldn't even have thought of these, th these things. I probably would have just messaged mum, dad, like, mum, what do I do? <laughs> um, but yeah, that's been, they're the main things that have really stuck with me um, from these talks. Thank you so much, Izzy, for sharing that. And I love the fact that being on these talks has just raised your awareness to realise that income protection does exist that you know who to speak to to look at making sure there's a policy that's right for you you know how important pensions are to start early and that just shows that the messages and what our ideals uh, that you have just improving these financial intelligences and also just empowering people to realize that these products exist who to speak to about them and what an impact they can make as well so honestly thank you for sharing that Izzy that's 
so useful and hopefully there'll be bits that people resonate out there and just realize this is your opportunity to to realize all these things exist so you don't end up like like me personally who realized that income protection existed about six years graduated when somebody said they've got an income protection policy I was like what's that then and had a bit of an invincibility complex probably as well so thank you so much Izzy and I'll just quickly jump back to Ebony and see how are we getting on with our poll results at the moment yeah, about 45% saying, yes, please, that'd be great. About 50% saying, I'm not sure right now. And 5% saying, I've already got one, so I'm good. Amazing. So we have popped the link in the chat if you would like to book in with Andrew, and that will be in the Padlet as well. But now we're going to head into some question and answer sessions where you've got the opportunity to ask um, Paul, Matt, Ebony, Andrew, myself, any questions whether it's looking at packages, whether it's looking at any of the things that we talked about, or whether you feel like there's just a niggling question of, I'm not even sure who I should ask this to, just private message it to one of us, drop it in the chat, we are here to help you. So I'm gonna hand over to um, Charlotte and to Callum, who are gonna look at some of the pre-submitted questions that have come up and also keep an eye on the chat to start firing those across on behalf of AVS too. So over to you guys. Hello, hello. Hope you guys have really enjoyed that. I definitely had. I didn't know anything about it. So thank you so, so, so much for getting this going and for teaching me about this, setting me for life, literally. <laughs> um, so I'm going to put the first um, question in the chat so you can all see it. So do you have any advice for negotiating salary in your early career? How to negotiate a package when joining a grad scheme? I wonder if you guys could help us answer that. Paul is your negotiation guy, so I think we should answer <laughs> Paul. <laughs> so uh, th this is quite a tricky one, but I've, I, I have, in the digital delegate bag, uh, I did a, a video, it was about a 20 minute long video uh, a year or so ago. Have a look there if you want a little bit more in depth about, about prepping and, and doing negotiation. And it's a little bit more tricky as a new grad going in there because uh, potentially you haven't got as much power uh, in the negotiation as you will have in a few months when you go from knowing everything but perhaps not having the uh, having it on the tip of your tongue a few months in you will be the complete package and you will be a uh, gold dust rocking horse shit whatever we want to call it um, so initially when you're going in there to negotiate especially if it's with a, a corporate on a, a graduate scheme it's a lot more difficult to try and say I'd like a little bit more because if a great if a large corporate is employing I know a couple of hundred vets they're not suddenly going to go oh yes we'll have them all on different on different salaries what you can negotiate with though is worth doing is getting that pay review in uh, as quickly as possible that's uh, so have a think about things like perhaps not the salary but other bits and pieces that you might want to negotiate in Six months in, you are now flying as a vet. You've got uh, you've got all the, the 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 butterflies out your system. You are uh, a a commodity that they want. So perhaps then, rather than waiting for a year to get your salary review, try and ask, could I have it in writing to have a salary review in six months? That's worth uh, worth going in, and then you can negotiate with a bit more strength there. Have a think about other bits and pieces that you might want. A little bit more CPD uh, will be a lot more a lot easier for the um, uh, for the employer to give you than a bigger salary because you might then uh, there, you, there might be other people who are on that salary and, and cause all sorts of problems so have a think around the subject because you're right it's quite difficult on that very first role um, getting in there afterwards as you'll see on the digital delegate bag I'll move on so we don't spend all time just on negotiating if you have a look at the video um, absolutely go in there know your worth do your research um, because uh, employing the getting the right vet is worth many thousands of pounds more to the employer uh, and so if you ask for an extra thousand two thousand three thousand you've got a stronger chance of doing it but the, the, I, I go into more detail in the video thank you Paul that was really good and I guess it's such an important skill as well Paul and I know in previous sessions um, it's worth probably signposting the other um, kind of uh, webinars we've done because you've explained contract negotiation very well there I guess in, in kind of chat about contracts as well, though, um, is there anything kind of we have to consider in differences in, say, part time contracts? Um, do they present any kind of issues that we should be kind of wary of? Uh, part time, I'll, I'll look at the others to jump here, but part time as a whole is 
is a bit of a tricky one in veterinary because unfortunately, fortunately for unfortunately, we all don't like leaving on time. And I think uh, that as a part-time vet, uh, often you'll end up working a lot more than you think you're going to be working. So that's just a, a, a real mistake that a lot of part-time vets do is, you know, say they finish at 12 o'clock, lots and lots of uh, part-time vets end up staying till one or two and doing a lot of free work. So that's something to have a think about. Um, also have a little look, there's, there's, a, there's one that I've been seeing recently that's, that's sort of sneaking in, especially in out of hours, this is an interesting one, is where they, um, on, on part-time and those sorts of contracts, is where they uh, put the holiday in the time that you're not working. And so it's an annualized contract. And that can be a little bit uh, a little bit sneaky um, because you think you're working, uh, I know, one week on, one week off, and you've got 20 days holiday. It turns out that you haven't got those 20 days holiday. It is just one week on, and you're supposed to take your holiday in the one week off. That, so annualized is just, just go, oh, okay, I'll stop there. I need to do a little bit more research on this it's just as a little flag word it's not not wrong it's not bad it's just that it might um, it might make you make a mistake <clears throat> i think that's a really good point paul just to add in the difference between if you say you said my part time is for half days a week you might actually end up almost staying longer and having a conversation with them of how do i ensure that i go on time or is it easier for you to do two full days if it was part-time and just being aware of those things, particularly part-time. I, I totally agree with what you said there, Paul. Yeah. And just one other comment from me. I think whether you're part-time or a full-time contract, if you can demonstrate some commerciality, then I think you're going to be very attractive to any veterinary employer in the future. And, and, and don't, don't, uh, don't underestimate your ability in that commercial environment. If you've worked in any customer service role, if you've had to deal with any customer, whether it's serving beer behind a bar in the union or waiting tables, you've, deal, you've dealt with people and commercial aspects of, of, of life. So those are the sorts of skills that lots of veterinary employers these days are looking for to, to alongside what they take for granted is your MRCVS qualification. So uh, anything like that you can demonstrate will definitely make you more employable and more valuable so you can uh, push for that extra few pounds uh, in your contract. Lovely. Thank you. I think we all want those extra few pounds. <laughs> always very appealing um we just got a message from christina here in the chat say not sure if this is appropriate for this talk but what about maternity or paternity pay uh, it, 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 have a look in your contract there is a minimum uh, but all of a sudden vet the the veterinary employers seem to have woken up to the fact that uh there are a lot more uh females uh, coming through they want to try and employ them uh, it's a an employee's market. You've got the power. You get to choose where you go at the moment. Uh, there are uh, not enough vets and lots and lots of jobs. And so they are now starting to uh, offer. And I've seen over the last 12, 18 months, almost like a uh, like an arms race to, to start suddenly going from the absolute bare minimum five years ago uh, to now offering uh, enhanced maternity pay or bonuses when you come back, little golden handshakes when you come back to work after six months, eight months, 12 months to say welcome back. So yeah, absolutely. But that's again, that's that's uh, uh, they are just using that to encourage you to stay or encourage you back in uh, as, a, as a recruitment tool. But, yeah. And this is something that many of my friends at, at my um, year of graduation have now negotiated in their annual reviews as well. Um, and it's not just women. So I've got friends, uh, have fathers who have taken the, you know, have negotiated for that paternity um, leave as well. So I think it's, it's great that actually everyone can be involved and take the time out uh, and be supported and remunerated accordingly. And I guess that's so important, important as, new, as a new graduate that we kind of know our own self-worth and we go into that negotiation and, and kind of uh, bargain as, as appropriate. Um, we've had another great question come in in the chat, actually, um, and it's mention of if you are in the UK on a visa, um, how this might affect your insurance or pension schemes and whether there's anything that, that may change in that front. Andrew, probably best for you. Uh, you're, you're, you're fine. So there's, from a, from a pension perspective, it'll be whether you're, um, you've got a... UK, UK earnings, uh, and you can evidence a UK address. 
then you'll be fine. But in terms of the pension potentially can stay here or you potentially can move it back to whichever country that you, um, you're, you're, you're from. Uh, from an insurance perspective, again, you'd be okay whilst you're in the UK. And then potentially it could be portable depending on which country you're going back to. But you'd need to look at the, the terms and conditions of the um, insurance product to know for sure. But you do that at application stage. Another one, Andrew, for you that's come just come in the chat. Could you could you recap the difference between a state pension and a personal pension, and can you have both? Yes, you can have both. the The state pension is funded through your national insurance contributions. So, um, for to to get a full state pension, you need a minimum of thirty five years national insurance contributions, and in today's money, it's a little over ten thousand pounds. Your private pension, as it sounds, is funded by yourself. Uh, and or your employer or someone else. Um, your state pension, um, the age for that is just going further up and up and up. So 66, 67, who knows, there might not be one about um, when you actually go to retire, which is a really sad moment, uh, something to think about, but the reality of it's true. So that's why it's super important to take that out from chance and fund your own private pension. So just to reiterate, your private pension will be funded by yourself and or your employer, usually, and your state pension is funded by your national insurance contributions. Great, thank you. That was really, really good. Um, another question's come on. So many people are chatting, I was trying to find it again. Oh yes, yeah, someone's asked, following on from the um, sort of abroad kind of questions, um, could I ask what, what would happen if we went to work abroad for a year or so with regards to our pension or insurance? Um, I'm assuming we may need to alter our insurance, but we can still pay into our pension. So again, it, in terms of your insurance, that depends. It depends where you're going to be working. Um, and actually, from um, the work perspective, that also depends. So I'll give you the example of what I mean from the pensions perspective. So let's assume that you had a job in the UK and you went to work uh, in Sweden. Don't know why I picked Sweden, right? And But the, um, the uh, employer was an English employer who have a branch in Sweden, as an example. In that respect, nothing changes and you can still contribute because you're actually employed by the UK. It's just a Swedish branch. If, for example, you stop working here and you've got an opportunity to do, do work experience or work a few years in Sweden, you go out there, your pension would stay, what we call um, would be dormant. Um, you couldn't pay into that at the time. But when you come back, you can continue to uh, contribute back into that pension. So it doesn't die just because you've gone away. It just waits there and actually if you've got no uk earnings you can contribute up to three thousand six hundred pounds um per year into your pension so it depends on circumstance the point being you might not lose anything and it might not make any real difference so speak to someone like me <laughs> i think that's obviously very reassuring to hear as well <laughs> from um a kind of perspective of if you were traveling back to to another country or or going abroad um but in terms of kind of starting off your pension is there is there like a base for how much you should be putting in or, or what are your recommendations there andrew we just had a, a simple question come in asking um, how much um kind of an, an initial contribution should be okay so um i would i'll go back to the point paul made in terms of um when you start work the first um, pay packet you get, I'd actually extend that to a few actually and say, just enjoy it. Enjoy that pay package. Get used, don't listen to Matt. <laughs> get used to life and understand what works, what doesn't work. Then you'll be in a position to commit to a level of contributions. Because the important thing is one, you start, but two, you continue. So don't get ahead of yourself and say, I'm going to put in 200 pounds a month, but then you realize that actually, shit, I need that because I want to go on the piss or I want to go out for dinner or wherever it may be, um, and then you don't do it. So in answering your question directly or the question directly, the most important thing is to start. The second point is that um, you have auto enrolment, so you're going to have to put, have a pension unless you choose to opt out and don't do that. So that's the second part, right? So the third part to that question is you're automatically going to contribute 
8% of your salary gross per annum without you doing anything as long as you don't opt out. So anything above on that, above and beyond that, is fantastic. And it's whatever you decide is appropriate. It's different for everyone. Um, I, as an advisor, would say, put as much in as you can and live on beans on toast. But that's not realistic. So, you know, do a budget, which is the first thing you should do before all of these things. Be realistic with your budget. And then just say to yourself, I'm going to pay an additional 2%. And then next year, increase that by another 2%. And before you know it, you'll be at the 20% that I uh, mentioned earlier on in the uh, discussion. And you won't actually notice that in your daily, um, uh, and the daily deduction, or sorry, monthly deductions from your salary. Mm, that's really, really good to know. Again, like every little helps, I guess, as Tesco likes to say. Yes, love <laughs> um, Can you cover what contract law is um, and anything we should watch for? Matt. <laughs> Matt. <laughs> As in terms of uh, your veterinary contract, well, obviously, um, it's good practice for you to have an employment contract. So if your employer has not provided you with an employment contract, it's absolutely your right to request one. Very important that you have written down evidence of what they're expecting you to do within your role and what benefits they're gonna provide you, including your financial remuneration for, the, for, for, for that in return. Um, having it written down really stops any of those uh, disagreements or arguments halfway through the year when you uh, request what you thought you'd been promised at the start. So absolutely, please get a contract. Um, it, it's, uh, it's vital uh, that you know wh where and how you should be, uh, be, be functioning as a veterinary surgeon. Um, more detail than that, certainly drop us an email through the VetU website and we'll see if we can help you with an individual circumstance. Amazing. We all looked at Matt for that one and we're like, you're the other guy to answer this. I was just going to jump in and say, I am aware that we have just gone past the hour now. So if anyone is on the call and needs to go, that is absolutely fine. We respect your time, but I know for now we were quite happy to carry on for a little while and answer a few more of those questions, weren't we? Yeah, but just before we do that, it'd be really lovely just to quickly um, see and relaunch the poll we did at the very beginning, which is, you know, how confident do you currently feel about your finances now that you've had a bit of time with us here? Um, with one not confident at all and 10 being extremely confident. Um, let's just see if we've moved you at all, because the majority of you um, at the start of the call were between the fours and the sixes out of 10. Um, so it'd just be really nice to see whether we've just notched you up one or half a point up, because that was our aim, was to move everyone up one point um, and help you take action and help you feel confident enough to know um, who you need to, to call on for support. So it's absolutely brilliant here that 48% of you are now on seven, which is wonderful. Uh, we've got 18% of you on eight. We've even got 9% of you on nine. Um, we've still got a couple of lower numbers. So we've got a couple of people on the one person on the three, uh, a couple of people at the fives and sixes. So yeah, the threes, fives and sixes, you know, I cannot recommend highly enough booking in with Andrew. Andrew um, is my financial advisor and I, my finances are in absolute state. And this man has helped me get out of debt within 18 months um, and start all the things that I need to start um, and sort out all of my finances where they're all, all over the shop. So um, yeah, I can't, I can't recommend him highly enough as someone who, who really has your back as well. And we've popped that link multiple times in the chat. If you would like to book in with Andrew, it is in the digital delegate bag as well. These are no obligation, no pressure. You're not going to get on there and feel like you're being sales pitched to. Andrew wants to help. And at the same time, there are going to be no stupid questions. We know ourselves that we tell people, don't go to Dr. Google, come to the people that are actually in the know. And that's why we partnered up and brought Andrew to you this evening as well. So good to see everybody jumping up a few points on that scale. Right, we'll hand back for a few more questions, shall we? If we've um, we've got to the end of the the poll, Ebony. Yeah, yeah. we've on. still got we've still got some great questions coming in. Um, I guess one of the ones that kind of sticks out to me is is probably quite a personal one actually. Um, and to ask the team, 
about um, any tips or tricks on making sure that you're not overwhelmed with finances. Um, I know we've already kind of touched on personal experience and stories, um, and we've just mentioned reaching out to the experts, but do we have any other kind of pieces of gold dust that, that can be passed down? I'll just share one thing I think is really important. Often our imagination is worse than our reality. And I thought I was in a real pickle and I wasn't in a great, the greatest space, but there's no point in making assumptions about it being bad. Like, what does that even mean? What does bad mean? What does good mean? So actually just actually getting down with someone like Andrew or also on your own, you can do this first and just go through that financial health check and get the facts like go through the bank statements and get the facts. And then you can actually be like, oh, this is the evidence of where things are going or where I could make savings. And rather than just being all in your head, like I just get so overwhelmed. I just do, I just do, I, when I'm overwhelmed, I don't do anything. I just procrastinate, I stop, I don't do anything. So actually just getting the facts massively helps with overwhelm and chunking and checking it down into, you know, five year goal, three year goal, one year goal, you know, what, what am I gonna do this month, you know? And having someone there to help you be accountable to that massively helps with the overwhelm uh, and accountability really helps too so checking in with the team at vet you or with a financial advisor or with a buddy um can can just really really help so for me mass big tip is actually get the evidence before you start stressing definitely anything to add to that as well ebony such a good answer if you do check out the vet you website on the news section we did a financial mot and i know i certainly used to put my head in the sand a lot and do very similar to what ebony's just talked about there where you think, you know what, this is too big. I can't even begin to look at it. So either reach out for some help or it's not as uncomfortable as it seems just to say, right, what is the first smallest step that I could do? I'm going to log in. I'm going to check my balance. I'm going to look at what goes in and what goes out with zero pressure and then step back from that because that can sometimes be the scariest thing. And yeah, reach out and speak to people. And I know Ebony and I were going to look at running along with Vet You, a money mindset webinar as well, which a lot of that is what scares us the most is that we've been taught that money is scary or worrisome and stepping back and looking at it in a different way can be really, really valuable. I know everyone else will have more to add to this as well, but. Yeah, yeah so my, my comment is, you know how quickly the last five years of vet school went, you know, it doesn't seem probably a few you know, many months ago that you were back in freshers week in your first term at vet school i can tell you that your veterinary career will go even more quickly so definitely don't put off till tomorrow what can be done today you know make that decision and however small and, and however little you may be earning now just start paying a small amount into things like a personal pension you know get get the basics covered with some income protection and maybe if you can consider some sort of health cover one of the each of those three buckets you know because month for month they'll come by and at some point in the future you'll be so thankful that you made that start great thank you guys for your personal like views as well it's really nice to hear from what you guys have gone through and tips and tricks to help us younglings <laughs> um so we've spoken about sort of pensions which are a form of investment but are there any other types of investment that we can sort of put our money into any spare money that we may have left over after splashing a bit <laughs> yep so you can you can utilize ices um in if, if you're investing um you, you shouldn't really be doing that unless you've done the first parts of the process first. So that's, you've done your, um, your income and expenditure. Uh, you've made sure that um, you're okay in terms of the protections. Uh, you've made sure that you've got your emergency fund in case something happens. And then anything above and beyond that, then perhaps you should be looking in, to invest. And when you're investing, the funds that you're investing, those are funds that you're, and put it another way, if you're investing, really, it should be for a minimum of five years. So any money that you're putting away, in your mind, it should be, I can do without that for quite some time. Because as everyone knows, investments can go up and as well as down. And there's loads of stuff out there like Bitcoin and things like that that people get really happy about. But there's a relationship between risk and return, the bigger the risk, uh, the higher the return, but also the higher the potential for you to lose all or some of your money. So I, yes, there's lots of options in answering your question directly. ISAs are the 
obvious option because it's a tax efficient environment. But what I would say is make sure all of your ducks are in, uh, in a row before you look at that. And then really it's a, it's a, it's a decision between the level of access and flexibility that you want and your ISA allows you to do that. And um, if you are investing as opposed to be saving, then go into a stocks and shares ISA as opposed to a, a cash ISA. Thank Hope you. that was helpful. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Thank you. Yeah, I think it's, it's really good to kind of hear all this explained in, in quite um, simple terms and, and helps us to really get to grips with it. Um, one of the, the other questions that's come in is, is kind of asking about kind of unreasonable demands. Um, and I wonder whether coming back to contracts and the likes, whether there's any way we can ensure that we don't end up in a situation, say, working too many hours or, or kind of expected to do too much um, and how we ab avoid that. Yeah, I'll pick this one up. That's a very, a very good question. Um, there are certain legal standards that every employer must follow. Uh, when issuing the contracts and when requiring you to do certain uh, tasks and elements at work. Um, they're too numerous to maybe go through in, in on, on this forum in front of everybody, but if anybody has any particular concerns about their contract, please um, don't hesitate. I've dropped my personal email in the chat box. Uh, drop me an email if there's anything in that regard that we can help you with or signpost you to the right uh, professional legal advice, then we'll certainly do that. Yeah, and I think that support's always going to be invaluable, um, especially as a new grad, as you kind of step out into the, the big bad world, as they say. Yep. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, not every uh, veterinary employer is as fastidious as they should be. So, um, yeah, we want to make sure that we can signpost people to the right types of agreement and, and service contracts that they should be signing up to and, and really calling out those employers that are you know, pushing the boundary or, or, or not looking after their veterinary workforce. I think that might have wrapped up the questions. <laughs> Amazing. Well, we seem to have covered an awful lot of ground this evening. Um, thank you so much to Andrew, thank you to Charlotte, thank you to Callum, thank you to the Vet U team, and thank you to Izzy as well, and everybody for being on here. I really hope that that was useful. As ever, there are probably going to be more questions that pop up that you think, oh my goodness, I really wish that I'd asked that. And that's normal. It might just need some time to percolate. Please do get in touch with us. Please do ask the questions. That's what we're here for. That's why we're passionate about this as vets, as employers, as employees, as freelancers in all areas of the vet profession, you know, we're, we're here, we're not going to say any questions stupid. So if you are interested to book in with Andrew, like we said, it's obligation free, there's no charge. It's Andrew's time that he's kindly gifted to us. The link is everywhere, you'll see that. If you've just got questions for the vet U team, the email will be in the chat box as well. And this recording will be available afterwards so you can rewatch any of this at your leisure too. If you've not managed to jot everything down notes wise, there's loads of resources in the digital delegate bag on the Padlet, on the website. You'll have hours of financial fun if you so wish on there too. So it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you all so much for being here and for gifting us your time and coming along and putting yourselves ahead of the financial game for these first hundred days in practice. You will not regret it. And anyone that has jumped up on the poll scale. Fantastic. Any of you that are still struggling or still worried, get in touch. That's what we're here for. So thank you all so much. It's been absolutely brilliant and we really appreciate your time and all of you for being here. Yeah, and a huge thank you to ABS as well. And do remember yes. that if you are students, then um, you, know, you have ABS there to support you um, as well um, in, a, in a myriad of different things. Um, and we're, we're there to support them you know, with this financial journey, but please do remember that ABS is an amazing support system um, as well. So Callum's popped in um, the email for them too. So just pop into the chat now. What's the one thing you're gonna do as a result of being here with us tonight? No yeah. matter how small, because knowledge is only powerful if we place it into action. So just what's the one thing you're gonna to commit to doing? This is like your little bit of accountability hub here. And if we write stuff down and we mm. say it out loud, we tend to do it. 
Um, so <laughs> I love it. Izzy's like in block capital, mm -hmm. sort out my income protection. Good. Good work, Izzy. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Andrew. I've just got to fly, but you can book in with Andrew. Thank whenever. you so much, Andrew. Andrew. What you're going to do. Um, and yeah, it'd be great to see. Yeah, keep popping those in the chat, guys, because like Ebony says, there's one thing for us to accumulate loads of knowledge on something, but there's another thing for us to act on it. So let's commit to one thing that we can do. And we've just been joined by my cat who decided she was going to bash down the door midway through that presentation. <laughs> <laughs> Love that. Really review my budget and cut out the unnecessary spending, pay maximum pounds into my pension as soon as I can and decide how I'm going to treat myself. Brilliant, absolutely. So it's not all at lack. Um, we need to get good at also rewarding ourselves for when we when we do do the things that we said we were going to do. Definitely. Do you remember, Ebony, what your first paycheck was spent on? An Audi A3. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Did you, did you get your advice off Matt and go for the, the soft top sports car? <laughs> But I think with my, I think with my next, uh, my, I'm about to hit another financial goal, so I think I'm going to take myself off to Matt's house in Ibiza. <laughs> Paul, nice. do you still have your car? <laughs> yep. Am, am I the only one that that was very sensible with their first paycheck <laughs> and diligently paid into income protection, yep. private health, and the yep. pension? Yep. You were very sensible. Matt is the richest of all of us, if that you. <laughs> yeah, if you'd like some evidence, then I didn't know income protection existed and I went and spent a lot of money at Lush and on a big shopping spree. I wish I had paid into income protection. Yes, yeah, still have fun with that first one, but it took me about six years to realise income protection even existed. So funny. Brilliant. All right, people. Um, really, really lovely to hang out with you all. And um, we look forward to connecting with you um, via email, call, social media. Um, we're here. So do Amazing. Yeah. Great. Take care, everybody. And yeah, make sure that you're following us on social media as well. Instagram is at BetU Community. You'll find us on Facebook as BetU as well. So please do follow us and we'll keep you up to date with new and upcoming events because there are plenty that are on our calendar. So take care, everyone. Have a lovely evening.